Hello, everyone. Welcome to the lineup. I'm Rick Goff. I'm your host for today. And joining us is a absolute legend in Michigan baseball. This man is in the Hall of Fame and a couple of different Hall of Fames. He's in the uh, Spring Arbor College Hall of Fame, uh, 2006 entrance. He is in the Michigan High School Hall of Fame, him and his team, the Homer Trojans that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. They were entered into the Hall of Fame in 2016. And in the 2012, he was enshrined into the Michigan High School Athletic Association Coaches Hall of Fame. I'm talking about none other than Scott Sallow. Scott, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, Rick. Appreciate it. Good morning, brother. Well, hey, listen, baseball season is upon us. As you can see, I have my Tiger shirt on. Let's um, go. Being in Michigan, I'm a diehard Tiger fan, and uh, we have struggled a little bit in the past years. Um, we're going to talk about that also in just a minute. We're going to get to some things that you do on the side as well. Sure. I, we've just got a lot of things to talk to you about today, Scott. Hey, you know what? I, I think your hour show, Rick, we're going to have to expand it, brother, to like two hours. we got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to talk about. I am I am deeply concerned that we can't get this in an hour. I think what's going to happen is going to be a part one and maybe a part two and a part six and a part nine. Um, I mean, just I, I'm looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to it for some time now and, and finally was able to get you here. So I'm excited about it. But let's kick it off about uh, your Homer Trojans. And you coach them to a then at the time it's been broken since but at the time right. it was a 75 game streak in high school baseball that is just crazy to to think that you can win 75 games in a row as you know as a, as a ball player and an umpire and, and, and you're certainly your affiliation continues with the, the beautiful game of baseball but thinking back at it now and just how many things could have gone wrong uh, you know it uh a misplay here, a miscall here, and yeah, here we are. Uh, you know, about twenty some years ago, almost, and uh, uh, talking about a seventy-five game win streak. Uh, it really didn't hit the kids and I until we were probably 15, 20 games into that season in 04. And, and uh, I made a joke at practice. I came down to practice one day, you know, serious face. I said, "Guys," I said, "I, I had my little Michigan high school uh, rule book with me. So I'm flipping it open. It's all staged, of course. Of course, they don't know." And I said, guys, right. I've been look, looking at this rule book, man, for weeks, and there's nothing in the rule book that says we have to lose this year. I said, let's just let's just go, man. And, and uh, who would have thought, you know, we win all the games that year, and then win the first 37 the next year in 05, and yeah, here we are at 75 games. Pretty cool. So, do you know at the time, did, what was the record that you broke? Do you know? Yeah, I think it was 70 or 71. A team from, I think maybe. Uh, New York had it for quite some time. And then a team from out in, uh, I don't know, man, it was out in New Mexico, I think, put it at like 70, 71. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, we, we, we had no clue what the record was. Our goal that year, obviously, is we were continuing to win games in 2004. We wanted to win a state championship. So uh, right. that, that was our thought. And then we got into the next year, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, the Michigan record is 50-something. And hey, the national record is 70-something, and all of a sudden, as we got closer then to trying to repeat our state championship uh, run in, in 05, uh, yeah, those records started becoming uh, a part of everyday conversation with the, you know, with the media outlet. So did you know about, I mean, I'm guessing that you knew about the state record before you even fathomed about the national record, is that correct? Yeah, yeah you know, it, 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 uh, and it, again, it didn't hit me until we got to the semifinals, we were playing Muskegon Oak Ridge in 04 over in Battle Creek. And uh, we're getting there, we're getting ready to take pregame. And a gentleman from the state came up and said, uh, Hey, coach, just you know, no added pressure, but if you win the next two games, you'll be the only team in Michigan history to have won every single game and had an undefeated state championship season since the state championship started being played, I, I think, in 71. And so that kind of a streak that day kind of became on our radar, but still at that point, I don't think I was aware of the Michigan record at whatever it was, 50 something. So originally he was just talking about the undefeated season. Yeah, that was the, that was the first one. Hey, you beat first Oak Ridge, one, yeah. you, you win the next day in the finals, you cap off, you know, kind of like Miami Dolphins, man. You just, you won them all. 
And it wasn't until the next year when we started rallying off more wins that all of a sudden, hey, here's the state record. Here's the record set by a, a group out in New Mexico. And, uh, and, and then again, at that point, we don't break that record, the national record, until we're in the district play over at Union City. So we're playing meaningful, meaningful games. So the streak was kind of running parallel with us trying to go back-to-back undefeated state champs. And uh, I'm sure we'll get to that throughout the show, but came a run short in 05. Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, you know, the guy that tells you that you need two wins to be the first team to do it. I mean, did you look at him kind of sideways and say, well, thank you very much? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It. Uh, I think we were all just starstruck at that point. You know, we, we're, here's this small team and a small school that nobody really had heard of. We had, you know, a pretty good district regional type of team. But uh, uh, at that point, no four that, that that day, you know, we had just beat Blissfield in a one nothing game. A legendary coach, coach uh, of course, Coach Tuttle, and uh, which propelled us into that, uh, that semifinal match. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to go back and uh, relive that conversation. I remember right where I was. We were in the uh, first base dugout. We had just finished pregame, and uh, hey, Coach, you win two more, you win them all, and you'll be the only one. To, you know, and now Orchard Lake St. Mary's did it last year. So, yeah, Orchard Lake St. Mary's. Um, coached by actually a friend of mine that I, I know very well, Matt Petrie. Matt Petrie, yeah. Uh, legend. They uh, they done it last year and and actually we're going to speed forward now that he is actually on course to to break your Michigan record. Yeah, you know I followed that state championship game last year and uh, uh, it was fun. I'm sure the Miami Dolphins do the same thing, you know. So I had a group text going with all of our guys because they had a, a really tight game. I think they played uh, Gross Point North, I think, in the finals and a one on one run game. And Gross Point had a couple of base running blunders. I'm thinking, Dad got it and. Uh, but yeah, best of luck to them, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm certain that they'll win the first eight, ten games, and uh, our state record will be gone. But uh, best of luck to Matt and his ball club. On a side note, there, um, Orchard Lake St. Mary's. Well, first of all, first of all, before we get into that, let's explain to everybody where Homer is and what it exactly is. It's about an hour and a half west of Detroit, okay. and it's a little small town um that has maybe 1800 people 2000 people is that accurate yeah. it, it's 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 yeah it's it's the it's the best of small town america it, it is when you close your eyes and you picture you know main street america and the barber shop and the pizza place and the hardware yeah. store and that that's homer and it's a it's a village man. Knows we, we, we didn't make city status we were a village and in a proud village and some great people there and um, yeah, the best of times for sure was had there what was your total enrollment at that school? Oh man, uh, your total enrollment. We we got to almost eleven hundred at one point. I think they're oh, sitting. You did. Yeah, I think we're sitting somewhere. I think they're in the nine, maybe just under nine hundred now. So it's, uh, it, it's we've lost some over over the course of time. But yeah, usually about a thousand kids, uh, typically for our uh, you know a, an average high school graduating class of sixty to eighty. So um, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Confused here a little bit. Your graduating class was sixty to eighty, but your high school total was a lot. Oh no, 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 no. High school was probably just just about three hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. yeah. Just now that makes more sense. Yeah, K twelve. We were about a thousand kids. K twelve. Okay. Well, we're we're talking about the high school portion of it. So you're talking about two fifty, three hundred kids. Yeah, we always bounced between division three and four. Uh, you know, we we won the state championship in oh uh, four. We were division three. Um, when we won our second state championship in 06, we had dropped down to Division Four with our enrollment. So, so we were kind of kids, right on that line. How many kids would you get to come to your tryouts? Uh, you know, just enough to keep. Uh, you know, that was always that was always a, a fun thing in Homer. I, 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 we didn't have to. I didn't cut anybody since I think 2003. So anybody that anybody that came out, we kept them. And uh, wow. you know, some it, some it, days it, we had uh, you know 22 dudes in the dugout, and some years it's 13, 14, and it always seemed like it just worked out. It was, so we wanted them to be a part of the experience. So if we had room in the dugout, um, we would keep them. If we needed bigger dugouts, we built bigger dugouts to maintain them all. But you, you think about that for a minute, Scott. And and you uh, played for a large school in high school, one of the biggest probably in the state of Michigan. Yeah. And, you know, you're cutting, you know, 30, 40 kids from from tryouts every year and then you go to some place like homer where you know sometimes did you ever like scratch your head and go are we gonna have enough kids to to, ma- to ma- have a team 
Yeah, no, you know, one year, I think maybe 2002, uh, I, I think was probably my leanest year. I think we, we probably traveled with about 12 or 13 kids. Uh, so that was probably the smallest roster. Most years, Rick, we were 18 to 20 and some, some years even in the low 20s. We just, we kept everybody and, uh, um, you know, obviously winning attracts kids. They want to be a part of that program. And uh, yeah. then on top of that, you know, we had six, seven managers and five or six coaches. And, you know, we had a, we had a major league outfit, man. You had a, we had a 40 man roster. But, you know, Scott, being in baseball as long as you have and, and me being around as long as I have, traditionally, if you come across a team that has to do that in order to survive, chances are they're not going to be very good. And here you are in Homer putting 75 wins in a row. Not only are you good, but you're, you're setting national records. It, 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 and, the, and the best part about that, Rick, is the quality of our kids, the quality of our families, the quality of our school district community. And, and these are our kids. Nothing against the private schools. They, they, they do their thing. But these, it, it was always fun because our kids would go play in the summer and they'd play together as a homer team. And they'd go yeah. play all these big tournaments. I know you're aware of them. And, you know, yeah. they'd say, hey, we're, oh, we got kids from all over the place. And I said, where's your team from? I said, man, we're from Homer. These, these are our kids. You know, they, they lived right there in the village or uh, in the outskirts. And so uh, having one with kids that are homegrown kids uh, just means the world to me. You know, and, and let's, let's talk about the obvious thing here. I mean, Homer, I mean, what a name for a baseball town. Right? I mean, Homer, Perfect. That, that's Hollywood. Yeah, and, and if you've seen our stadium, the balls jump out of there, Rick. It's a little bit like 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 uh, Fenway there, man. The balls jump out at the Homer Dome there. The wind the gets blown. The, the wind gets blown out of the south southwest, and it's uh, we we put up some good numbers there over the years. And uh, uh, we always we, our right field fence was a lot like the Green Monster. It was about I don't know two sixty, but it was tall. And uh, yeah, routine fly balls to right field are getting out at Homer. But, but I always said, man, both teams got to play there. Both teams yeah. got to play. There. That that's that's anywhere, right? I mean, both teams that's have right. to play under the same conditions, but absolutely, uh, but, uh, I great mean, home field advantage, great environment, and, and what a great name! I mean, like I said, that's something that Hollywood would make up. Like, well, we're going to call this town Homer, <laughs> you know, for this movie coming Very up. Fitting. Now, you know, you you made a comment about the the, the private schools, and I got to ask you, you know, what's your thoughts on the private schools? playing in a public school tournament. I mean, do you think they should have their own state tournament or are you okay with them being integrated? You know, I was a part of the executive board for, for the state for many years there. And, and that conversation always seemed to, to uh, work its way into our, our board meetings. And, and, and so, you know, I, obviously the, the selfish part of me is, you know, our, our, uh, our street came to an end by a private school. Uh, Saginaw Nouvelle beats us seven, six in 2005. And, Again, I didn't think much about it. Uh, here's Orchard Lake St. Mary's that's breaking every record now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm okay with it. You know, our our our, uh, our philosophy at Homer was anyone, anywhere, anytime. And, and that, that meant private school, public school. So I'm okay with playing them. Um, you know, our, our, our really good Homer teams, uh, and we had a lot of them, not just the teams that won state championships. Uh, yeah. we, we, would, we would play anybody. Uh, and I would – I would be willing to uh, to put my, especially that 04, 05, and 06 group, we would have played anybody in the state, uh, Division One, all the way down, and, and we would have held our own for sure. Yeah, I mean, do they still, Scott, do they still, and I, I've been out of the Michigan baseball scene for a few years, but does the Catholic League still play 3-2 baseball? I think they do. Yeah, down river, I think Catholic, yeah, I think they're still 3-2. I'm almost almost certain. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, here in Michigan, the Catholic schools, and I don't know if it's to speed up the game or, you know, what the reasoning is behind it. it. Um, they play 3-2 baseball, which is three balls gets a walk and two two strikes for a strikeout. And I know back in my day when I was heavily involved in Michigan high school baseball that it was a big uh, controversy because the records were skewed, um, especially when it comes to the pitching records were skewed. And right, so, you know, I don't know what the, the answer is to that or, or whatever, but, you know, that's that's for another day. Um, you know, let's go back to, we talked about the name Homer and I, I made a comment about that's a Hollywood name. I mean, 
did Hollywood ever come calling Scott about a story about Homer and the 75 game win streak? Hey, you, hey I've got some. Hang on. I didn't have this. This, yeah, you know, I'm up in my office here. So, yeah, we, I mean, we've had books written. I mean, how cool is this, right? Nice. We, we, we've nice. had a couple of books written about Homer. Uh, ESPN, which, which is probably one of the coolest moments uh, for us. Uh, unfortunately, we had just we had just lost in 2005, and then uh, boy, I, we lost on that Saturday. And I think the kids on Monday, I, I had to get the kids back in their uniforms because ESPN was coming down. They were doing I don't know if you remember this. They were doing a segment uh, called 50 States in 50 Days. So they went around the country and they did kind of a feel good, heartwarming story from each of the states. And we were the we were Michigan story. And of course, they followed us on our run. Unfortunately, we lost. But they put together this great video that ESPN ran. Um, but unfortunately, it was it was shot two days after we had just had our hearts ripped out, and the kids no. were having the kids were having to smile and do interviews. Oh, and, uh, it was that was that was tough, but uh, pretty cool to have. I mean, ESPN sets up shop on home plate on our home field. I mean, how cool is that? That is that is really cool. Stuff. That is really cool. Now, is there any truth to the rumor that they were looking to cast Brad Pitt as Scott Sallow in the movie that they were going to do? You know, very similar. That you know, Hollywood was looking for. They, they wanted obviously good-looking, well-built guys to play the role yes. of of the coach, and, and so Brad Pitt. If that's the best they can come up with, I I, I take Brad Pitt. <laughs> well, let's let's go back and talk a, a little bit about the streak. Um, there had to be some close games in there, right? I mean, you had to have escaped something maybe caught a break somewhere along the way along the way do you remember anything like that yeah, yeah one game stands out right but so here's the thing we, we set records in 04 5 and 6 for shutouts uh, I think we had 22 23 shut of our, of our 38 wins I think low 20s were shutouts we shut up real shutouts shut, we gave up and I'd have to check the record book 38 games I think we gave up 46 runs on the season wow Teams just didn't. I mean, we got three pitchers that are touching ninety, at you know in Division Three. You know, obviously, Josh Coleman, Danny Holcomb, Dusty Compton. So we're we're winning double head league double headers with kids touching ninety. We play non conference. I'm bringing out ninety again. I mean, so and that's it wasn't I guess tough, that's, it wasn't that tough to coach to make out a lineup those days. That's the thing that that amazes me about the little school of Homer with just 270 some kids. You had three kids touching 90. There's large division one or class A or whatever you want to refer to. They're lucky to get one. Yeah. And, and here top he it off. Three. And, and then if they ever did get on first base, my catcher, who ends up being Mr. Baseball in 06, plays at Central Michigan, gets drafted by Kansas City. If they get on first, they're not going to second. I mean, the kids are a one eight five pop time to second. They're just not running. So, but there, there were, back to your question, we did uh, we did have a close game, and uh, it had to be 0-4. Uh, we were over at Union City, and, and start of the game, rain. Only one umpire showed up. We were falling behind. I think we we're behind seven to one. And I just remember C.J. Finch, All State second baseman, two years. I, I think the greatest leadoff hitter in Michigan history. He's coming in and he is so fired up every inning. We're you know, we come in off the field and we're getting ready to bat and said, not today, coach, not today, guys, this isn't happening today. Uh, you know, the, the, the umpire would keep coming over and say, coach, if this field condition is getting any worse, we're going to have to bang this game. I'm thinking, no way. It, we may lose someday, but we're not going to lose with one umpire in a rain delay kind of mother game. nature, mother nature. I think we end up winning, I don't know, nine to seven or something, but that game sticks out. But uh, to be honest with you, Man, I, I tell it today. I mean, the hardest part of, of that group, really, especially towards the end when we were getting ready to compete for a state championship and then on to the next couple of years, wasn't making out the lineup, wasn't figuring out the pitching rotation. It was trying to figure out media and social media. We had newspaper, radio, TV at every one of our practices. How do you put the microphone and try to think? We would talk as coaches. Who didn't interview yesterday? Because we want them to have a chance to interview today. And so just trying to keep everybody engaged and everybody feeling good about themselves was probably the most difficult part of, of those years, for sure. Making out the lineup, we had all staters up and down the line. That was easy. Yeah, that's that was going to be one of my questions to you, Scott, is how you handle, I'm sure, all that media attention back then. And I can only imagine 
what that media attention would be like today because back then social media was just just then coming into play right and you know it's not as intensive as it is today so sure. you know a small town like homer getting all this media attention news vans everything else it, it leading up to all of this i mean kudos to you for handling that it sounds like you did it uh well with the players and with your coaching staff and and that had to be a challenge and, and sometimes it had to be a nuisance didn't it didn't it have to be didn't you just want to sometimes just tell them like get off the field you know, we, I think we just embraced it. You know, it was, it was what like every, everything that's not supposed to happen in small town America. It's like this, let's enjoy the moment. Uh, if we've got to stop and, and uh, uh, you know, probably the only thing I remember doing in 04 and, and, it, and it stuck and we kept doing it every day after I knew uh, it was a Kalamazoo. I think it was channel three out of Kalamazoo it was going to come to our practice. And so I made the kids that day wear ball pants, their game pants to practice. Cause I, we, hey, we're going to be on TV, man. We got to look good. And so right. from that, from that point on, from that point on, we wore game pants or, or practice pants, but matching, you know, not sweatpants, not shorts, not, you know, and matching tops every single practice from then on. But it all started because, man, we got to look good on, on TV here. There had to be, and I'm dying to know this answer. Right. There had to be some rituals. There had to be some some things that you guys did religiously over oh. and over again because the streak was intact. So share with us what those were. Oh man, it, there's yeah. I mean, the, everything was scripted. I mean, we so we we have something we call the seven factor. Uh, so th this was regardless of you know who we played, what the score was. We the kids had to sprint out to their position and then back in in seven seconds. And so we would rehearse it. We practice it. We you know, have our stopwatches out there. And so we always said that every at bat, every ground ball, every fly ball, everything was like the seventh game of the, of the World Series, right? We played seven innings. We just took that number seven and just ran with it. It was the seven factor. Uh, in our new dugouts in, in Homer, uh, it was etched into the dugout, seven factor. It just, it became a part of us and people loved to watch our kids play because they just got after it. But yeah, I mean, from how we talked to the kids and how we dressed, it was, yeah, we, we weren't going to change anything then for sure, especially when that streak, you know, the streak was going on. But probably my favorite moment, this was pretty cool. So I'm down at practice. And I, I, my cell phone, my secretary calls me and says, Scott, you've got a, a phone call. I said, I'm in the middle of practice. She's not, you might want to take this one. I said, all right. So what, it's Mitch Album. He, he wants you on his album in the afternoon radio show. I go upstairs in the press box. I'm on the phone doing a radio interview with Mitch Album, watching my kids practice on the field. I said, I mean, that's pretty cool. I say, Coach, you got to take this phone call. It's Mitch Album. Uh, that's good well, you know, you hear stories of, of players when they're in the middle of a hitting streak. They don't change their socks, you know, while they're in the middle of a hitting streak. Or they eat the same foods every day. So, I mean, with the streak that you had, could you imagine some of your players wearing the same socks and not washing them and not doing anything like that? I mean, that's a long time. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that, that's a that's almost two years for that bad boy. So, yeah, I, I don't know. That, I'm sure the kids had their own unique little ways of, of uh, you know, keeping things consistent throughout. The, uh, nothing stands out to me with that group. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we every day was business like we were a blue collar team. We just we just got after it. And I think people enjoyed watching us play because we were you know i tell the kids we were like farm and bailey we we're the greatest show on earth and uh, uh, it was fun to watch us take pregame we got the music going guys flying around the field and you know probably of all the stuff i miss most about coaching i miss the pregame i miss hitting the pregame with with the uh, crazy train and thunderstruck going on in the background and uh, oh, uh that, that I mean, because we yeah you know, we start with crazy train and, I, and i and i knew where we had to be with our pregame routine based on where we were at with the song. Yeah. I mean, we better yeah. be getting to the infield portion when Thunderstruck was going on. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're messing up somewhere along the line. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about something that's a little unpleasant. Um, you know, I'm sure the memories are, are still with you and, and I'm sure you probably replay this game over in your mind many, many times, but the streak comes to an end. Yeah. And, you know, what, what can you tell me, what can you tell me about that game? Yeah. You know, we, we, we uh, we're sitting at 75. We're, we're one game away from back to back. Now I remember a year ago, we're, we're 
the only team that wins every single game. And here we are now a chance to do it twice. And uh, that, that 76th game, you know, that, uh, um, yeah, we, we get off to a, a great start. Like, you know, we typically do. We're up, man, I think we're up five to one, six to one, Rick, probably third, fourth, fifth inning. And it, it's going a, a lot like our other 75 games. You know, we get off to an early start. We're playing pit, you know, pitching well. We're picking up the ball. And, and, and then there's that. That the beautiful thing about baseball is that one inning. You know, you, you inning. can't you can't call a timeout. You can't take a knee. Uh, you've got to record three outs and uh, a leadoff walk, a little routine ground ball where my third baseman's feet go out from underneath him. Probably would never happen again. It never happened before that. Uh, we get a double play ball that we try to turn two before we get the first one and it pops out. Oh. We get a little little the Texas leaguer that just over the outskirts of my second. I mean. Everything that could go wrong went wrong that inning. I tried pitchers. I mean, I, I went out to the mound. I, we're just beside ourselves. And, uh, they end up taking the lead, and we, we put the time run on base in the seventh. And, and at that point, I, I remember coaching third thinking, if this ends now, how are my kids going to handle defeat? Because they haven't hand, had to handle it in two years. Right. And now they're going to have to handle it in the biggest stage, full house, a sea of orange. And, yeah. and I'll tell you, maybe one of my proudest moments, we, we we ground out to end the game, time runs at third, staying on right with me. And I just sat back and I watched my kids. And I'll be, I, I, I'm telling you, not one bat was thrown, not one helmet was thrown. Certainly tears were shed. Uh, you know, they, they shook hands as they should. We, we stood there and recognized Saginaw Novellas, the state champs. And then we got on the bus and, and I got a phone call from somebody and said, hey, would you guys still like this police escort and fire truck escort back into town? And I said, absolutely. And so I told the kids, I said, get out your windows, wave, smile. I said, you're, you're everybody's hero. We came up a run short today, but uh, you're still a champion in my book. So uh, uh, certainly a tough day, a day I'd like to go back and, and replay that inning. And I have in my sleep and it always sure. ends up Sure. It always ends up the same, man. We always end up losing seven sets. Yeah, we've all been a part of those games where, you know, you see the train wreck in front of you and there's nothing you can do about it. And we couldn't stop it. And it was it just it was just it was it was meant to be that day. It was supposed to come to an end that day. And it was nothing tragic that we did wrong. It was just a kind of a comedy of of uh, of things that just didn't go in our favor. And uh, yeah. I think it makes a part of the history. I think it makes a part of the story. You know, how do you, how do kids, young high school kids, yeah. how do they handle defeat at its highest level? We're not talking about a loss in, in March and April. We're talking back to back undefeated state championships. And you come up one run short and really one inning short. And then to top it off, we come back in 06 and we win the next 30 games in a row then. Well, that, that was going to be my. That streak's never going to be touched. That that was going to be my next question. Had you won that game, what what would your number have been? Oh, it had to have been in the I don't know one I don't know 110, 115 probably. Yeah, we yeah. seventy five plus another thirty. I, I mean, it was it was crazy. And then, and of course, our next loss in 06 is the Grand Ledge. Guess what the score was? Seven six. Seven six. Seven six. So anytime I see seven six on the scoreboard, I, I have nightmares, Rick. I, oh. I, I shiver and I shake at night. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Seven six is not kind to the Trojans. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my goal, if I was, if I was in your shoes, I would tell my team, don't let the other team get to seven and we're going to be good. We're going to be good. Or, or we can't stop at six, you know, or we can't five, stop at six, eight, right? 14, something. <laughs> right. We don't want to stop at six. So the streak ends. I mean, is there a little bit of relief between you and your coaches when the streak is over? Or did you really have time to reflect about that? Uh, you know, it, no, I don't, I don't know if there was any relief. Obviously, huge disappointment. Um, you know, probably one of the things I was probably most disappointed in. So, so my brother was the head coach from 92 to 2000, you know, and, and I joined him in 96. And we always had great – you know, we're winning districts, we're winning regionals, and we can never get over the hump. And, and uh, that 04 team, Tom, Tom, my brother Tom, had stayed retired. 
And so we win that first state championship in 04, and he's in, in the crowd. I get him finally back in a uniform in 05, and, and we make that run, and we lose that state championship game. So for me, I wanted it so bad to experience that with my brother. You know, oh, he had right. kind of built this program to where it stands yeah. today and uh, put in a lot of hard work, certainly, to lay the foundation. And then, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so then in 06, we got a lot of kids coming back in 06. We graduated uh, really just one, one starter, a couple seniors. And uh, so I knew we were going to be loaded again. And, uh, and, and to win the state championship in 06 with my brother was pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, the disappointment was there, but uh, we knew we had a good ball club coming back in 06. And the tough thing about that, Scott, is you lose in the state championship game. And I know a lot of people say, well, when you lose, you know, you're going to play again tomorrow. And that had to be a, a tough thing for you guys. You guys had to go the whole off season with that yeah. loss setting right here. And instead of, you know, you could have went two days later, got back on the field, started playing again. That would have probably healed a lot of, of emotions and a lot of hurt. But you guys had to live with that for an entire off season. That had to be tough. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're, you're talking. Yeah, you're talking nine months. You know, you're 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 losing uh, somewhere mid June, and, and you're uh, you're you're not lacing them up again until probably you know, middle end of March. So right. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I can't I, I can't remember exactly, but uh, certainly that had to be a, a difficult off season. Um, but yeah, certainly proud of our kids. Um, that run was special. Uh, the, the kids are special. We talk often. Uh, I talked to Josh just yesterday, uh, getting ready for opening day, of course. I think you read one of my posts. Uh, I had a chance to fly fly out to Phoenix to watch him pitch in, in 2015 against the Giants. And, um, yeah, just the best of times, the best of moments. I'm, I'm blessed. I mean, somebody dropped me into a perfect situation there in Homer, Michigan. And to be able to lead that team for whatever it was, 20, 21 years, uh, Certainly the best athletic time of my life, for sure. Well, that brings me to the next question. How does Scott Sallow end up in small-town Homer, basically in the middle of Michigan, in the middle of nowhere? How, how do you end up there? Yeah, it's pretty secret, a simple secret. You, you follow your brother. I mean, my, my brother was, as you know, going to Monroe High, my brother was a gifted three-sport athlete. Uh, he went to Spring Arbor. Of course, little brother wants to follow him to Spring Arbor. Uh he gets a job at Homer. Uh, I'm trying to find a place to do my student teaching in the fall of 91. Of course, I call him up. He pulls some strings. I'm student teaching in Homer. Um, they didn't have a teaching job for me right then, so I, I took a teaching job in Taylor. And then I go back in the fall of 95 and join him. And, uh, man, being able to coach with your brother, being able to coach his two sons, my two nephews, have my dad be the game announcer, playing the music up in the press box. Family affair. And, it's a fam it's family, and uh, I know that's still the case today there in Homer, and uh, I, I still follow them uh, as closely as I can, and uh, hopefully I'll get out to a few games this spring. So your 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 time at Homer comes to an end. What what was the mindset with with you with that decision on making a move? You're now the superintendent at Summerfield, another little small town yeah. in Michigan. Um, it seems like you've got a pattern here. I don't know. People say. You know, people say when they date women, they have a they have a type. Well, it sounds like you've got a type when it comes to schools. Yeah, you talk. talk I mean, talk about dropped into a very similar situation. I mean, it's uh, the, the folks in Petersburg and Summerfield specifically have been outstanding. Uh, obviously, the similarities are are crazy. You know, orange and black, which I knew, I knew that because we had played Summerfield and, and and some different sporting events. And of course, you know, growing up right down the street there in Monroe, uh, what I didn't know until I got there. Same stinking fight song. I mean, come on, let's go. I mean, I was at one of my first administrative meetings and the principal pulled it up and said, hey, I'm going to play a song for you. What's this sound like? They play the fight song. I said, that's Homer's fight song. I said, no, no, that's Summerfield. I said, same stinking fight song, man. And uh, yeah, it, it's a, a tight knit community. So similar, some outstanding people. Uh, I've only been there just, just now over two years and, uh, uh uh, I love my time in Homer. Uh, I miss everybody there, but man, Summerfield's been great. And for me, uh, and, and my brother and I talked about it uh, when we took a trip for our, uh, our Homer team back in 17 or 18, we came down and played in a row and, and, and kicked their butts, by the way, 11 to two. I just want to, I just, I just want to mention that. Throw that out there. 
just want to throw that out there. I mean, uh, that's but, just uh, informational purposes. Yeah, just, yeah. But it, uh, and best of luck to Bubba. Bubba wasn't coaching me. The, uh, but, uh, but anyway, we, we had, we had kind of joked around on the bus and said, how cool would it be to come back home and kind of finish our, our coaching career or educational career back home? And, and, uh, yeah, here, here we are in, uh, in, in beautiful Petersburg, Michigan, man, making some magic. Well, look at it this way. Look at all the money you saved on wardrobe. Yeah, and, and I and I went neutral today. I went kind of like tiger blue today for opening day. Yeah. You know, I, I got plenty of orange and black. If you look around my my home office here, it is littered with orange and black. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm featuring, I've got, you know, my, my Homer hat. This is the one Homer I wore. Hat. State championship game. That's the last hat I had in my head here in Homer. My Summerfield hat, which which I, I put on, but I can't quite coach yet. It, it's still hard. And then I got my Diamondbacks for opening day, man, ready to go. Opening day for Josh. Yeah, boy. Well, this begs the question, you know, will Scott Sallow step back on a baseball diamond as a head coach? Oh, man. You know, I, I'll say definite maybe. And, and people that know me and, and follow all of my social media stuff, which I, 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 I post – I got one more post coming later today for opening day, but you know, baseball is a part of me. It's been a part of my family. I know it's been a part of your family. Uh, I, I know I, I, you know, growing up in Monroe and playing summer rec and playing youth ball. And I actually, I, I played one summer for you, your dad. Uh, and, and you were on our team there, one of our summer leagues playing at Navarre stadium there. Yeah. Uh, Navarre field. And yeah. so yeah, baseball from my grandpa, Rex Jones, to my dad, Tom Salas senior to my brother. And, and obviously the Homer run, it's just a part of me. And, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet against it. We'll, we'll find an opportunity to to maybe put on that jersey one more time. Well, let's. What about college, Scott? Did you have any opportunities to maybe make that jump to college coaching? I mean, you had to be a commodity with with this streak and and doing all of this. I mean, some some college coaches come knocking on your door. Yeah, you know what? I I only had really one college job in mind, and that was to to you know my alma mater, Spring Arbor, and. Uh, uh, you know, to, to play there under the legendary uh, Hank Burbridge, uh, Sam Riggleman, Hall of Fame coach, uh, replaced him, and and uh, yeah, there was some conversations uh, about replacing Sam there, and um, yeah, several meetings, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, decided to to stay in Homer with uh, with my high school kids. But uh, yeah, no, I, I'm definitely intrigued by the college game, and uh, maybe that'll maybe that'll be my next my next move. We'll see. I I feel like I got a lot of life left, and. Uh, um, I feel like I can still give back to the kids and, and I certainly miss it. Well, I'm sure that you do. And in, in any school, whether it's a college or high school, we'd be lucky to have you. Um, you know, that. you, you do uh, a lot of great things, you know, on and off the diamond, but that brings me to my next question. I've talked to high school coaches. I've talked to travel coaches and they all say the same thing that coaching today is extremely difficult relating to the players, um, you know, trying to connect with them. You know, how did you do it? How did you command the respect as many years as you did with your players and and not get burnt out or not get, you know, throw your hands up in the air going, look, I've had it with this generation. I'm, I'm just done. You know, what was the keys to you as a high school coach and your players? You know, I, I never, I never really felt, that certainly there were there were tough moments and, and, and tough players and tough situations over the you know 20 some years but for me the exhaustion at the end of the year was just knowing whether it ended up in a dog pile in battle creek or at east lansing or it ended up in disappointment like every other school that doesn't want to state championship faces and you got to have that meeting with your group that meeting that you just dread of the season's over we got to collect uniforms thank you seniors for your service and I, I'm crying and, and everybody's crying, but, you know, it, it all starts and ends with relationships. And uh, our, our, our kids at, at Homer and certainly at Summerfield are, are among the very best. And, and so I, I, I hope the, uh, the parents and the community felt that, uh, the love between player coach and coach player and, and player player. Uh, it was genuine. It was real. Uh, it, it takes time to develop that. Um, you know, to, to think that you're developing those relationships from three to five during practice time, it's not enough. Um, we, we talk in Homer about the difference between a team and a program. Everybody in Michigan offers a baseball team. We at Homer thought 
differently. We just thought it was a, ba a baseball program, meaning that your behavior, your academics, how you carry yourself in the hallway, how you carry yourself in town, how you wear your uniform, how you sprint out to your field, uh, out to your position, it just all matters. And it all matters in the game of life. And uh, uh, so many parallels uh, with, as you know, life and baseball. And, and that's why, and I love sports, all sports, but baseball to me will always be, it's America's pastime. And it, it is the world's greatest sport, a sport that between the white lines and even outside of the white lines, so many life lessons can be taught and learned. And, 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 and I hope I taught the kids some, and certainly they taught me just as many. And, uh, but yeah, it, it all comes down with relationships, but I never felt it was hard reaching the kids. Uh, I, I really didn't. And I know I hear that from coaches too, that they've changed and, and maybe they have, uh, but, but life has changed. And, and in the last three years in our, in our country, my goodness, we, we have thrown, uh, thrown kids uh, a, a curveball for the ages. And uh, we need to be responsive to that and their needs. And it's more than just now extra batting practice and extra bunting practice. It's now, you know, where are you at emotionally and physically and, and spiritually? And, and uh, it, it's just, it's just tough. Life's a journey, man. You faced it. I faced it. Uh, but uh, life is good. You know, we got up today, we put our feet on the ground and we're going to watch some opening day baseball. So um, good stuff. What um, Scott, what's you had a great number of players that played for you over the years and you had Josh go on and, and start actually opening day for the Arizona Diamondbacks in 2015. But what's some advice that you would give today's players when they're trying to look to play college baseball, you know, what's some things that they should do and shouldn't do. And, and, and this is a great question. because I think it's a great parallel to life again. And I tell the kids all the time, right? What do you do that your opponent doesn't do you, you you're going to go to the showcase and there's going to be 70 other second basemen. they're going to look like you they're going to dress like you what is the difference between you and the other 69 is it coachability is it attitude is it hustle is it pride is it commitment is it effort um something has to separate you because then fast forward 10 years from now you're sitting in a foyer waiting to be called back to that job interview same question. What do you bring? Now, I, I got a feeling I kind of know your answer on this next question I'm about to ask you. But, um, you know, in today's society, you see more kids seem to be, and, and it, maybe it's just a conception of mine, but they seem to be specializing in sports, finding one and just sticking with it and training year round. What's your take on that? And, and what what's your, your take on the importance of multi-sport uh, athletes? Yeah, you know, I... For, for Homer, we were so small that our better athletes had to play. We needed them to play two to three sports. We, we had to have them. We had to have them. So I encourage kids to play three sports, two sports for sure. Uh, I, I loved it because I'm, I'm a fan outside of, of baseball. I love watching the kids on Friday night football in, in small town America when you got cars backed up to the fence, the lawn chairs out there watching Friday night football and, and certainly basketball and wrestling or cross country, whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, Josh Coleman, a great example. I mean, class valedictorian, quarterback, forward on the basketball team, all-state baseball kid. He's a three-sport kid. And I've got many, many other examples of kids that played three sports. Now, we had some that, that ended up playing just one by the time they got to their senior year. Uh, Danny and Dale, co-mister baseball in 06. Dan Holcomb and Dale Cornstubble played all of the sports going through. But by the time they got to their senior year, they were committed. They knew what they wanted to do. Dale had just signed with Central Michigan. Danny had signed with Evansville. And so they ended up their senior year being one sport kids. But but growing up, man, they were playing three sports like everybody else. So I'm all for it, man. I want to see you. I want to see you compete outside of the baseball arena. I want to see what you can do when somebody's pressing you in basketball full court. I want to see you down 10 with four minutes to go on the clock in football and see if you can create two scores. That tells me a lot when I get you in the spring, what I'm working with. You want to see them uncomfortable. Absolutely. And, and, okay. and, and we say that in practice. Our practices, Rick, should be as, as difficult as the games. Our, our tempo in practice had to be that that they were going to face in the game. And I would tell the kids that today. If we see something in a game that happens, some create a creative play that you never see before, it's a highlight on ESPN, it never happens, hey, you know what? and we never practice it, that's on me. That's on me. 
we never took time to practice a ball that hits the third base, bounces off the umpire. You know, that's on me. Everything, everything else was well rehearsed and well practiced. Even the crazy first and third play, we end up winning in 04 on a on a first and third play against Muskegon Oak Ridge in the top of the seventh. And it's a play that we had just practiced the day before. The ball didn't even have to be thrown, and we found a way to score. That takes practice, and our kids were committed to that. Practice makes perfect, right? That's Amen, what brother. Say. Amen. Practice makes perfect. Uh, so one of the things we're going to talk about now is, is Scott's uh, blog that he has on Facebook. It's called Extra Innings, Living My Best Life. If you guys get a chance to check this out, I highly recommend it. He's done a, uh, a post here the last couple of days, and it has to do with baseball, and that's that's the main reason why he's on the show is to talk about this. I know we took a, a long way to get there, Scott, but we're finally here. And, yeah. um, you know, I highlighted I, – I love everything that you put on this list, by the way, <laughs> but I had yeah. to highlight a few things that I kind of wanted to touch on that I think our fans would enjoy. So, you know, we're going to talk just a little bit about, you know, a couple of different things here. Um, basically everything starts with, I believe, and then Scott, uh, informs us of what he believes in. Um, one of the things that, that is on here, we'll start with the list here. I believe that hitters should not be allowed to wear more protective, protective gear than the catchers, man. That is, that is, an, Come uh, on, let's go. It's a profound statement. They got like full body armor these days. I mean, what, let's go old school, no batting gloves. Get up there like the old school hitters and just hit. I mean, come on already. Yeah. Um, I believe that Mel Allen's This Week in Baseball oh. is the greatest highlight show of all time. And I couldn't agree more, man. I wish oh, they oh. would bring it back. Mel Allen is an iconic voice. The voice of Major League Baseball. Vince Scully right there, but come on, Mel Allen. I believe that Mark Fidrich was one of the most entertaining players in baseball. And I couldn't agree more. I, I wish baseball had more characters. There's not characters in today's game. Yeah, you know, I think baseball, I mean, football is obviously Sunday football. And now you've got you know football every single day of the week with Matt yeah. games and Thursday games and high school. And, and basketball has got its popularity. But baseball, you're right. I mean, maybe maybe the World Baseball Classic will help propel us into something this year. It had some really good games. But, I mean, Mark the Bird Fidrich, I mean, I, you didn't even care if he was good or not. And obviously he was very good, but he just brought people to watch. It was, it was an event when he was on the mound. An event. Well, I, I know major league baseball is doing some things to try to uh, improve attendance and do, and you've got some ideas on here that we're going to get into that I think will help major league baseball. Baseball needs to listen to Scott Sallow. And Absolutely. Some of I've been saying it for years. You want to speed up the game? Hustle. 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 Seven seconds. Come on. Simple. Uh, I believe that players that lose fly ball, I love this one, lose fly <laughs> balls in the sun while wearing their Oakleys on top of their hat need to run stairs after the game. Let's go. I mean, you got the sunglasses. You did You did half the work. You took them out to the field with you. Put the sunglasses on. I believe the hardest thing in sport to do is hit a baseball. I think that's been a proven fact, though. I, I think I they've so. done a survey on that. I hope so. Okay, I, I I think I'm right on that one, and I and I wasn't a very good hitter, but I, I think I'm right on that one. It was either number one or number two, and either number one or number two, believe it or not, was to drive a NASCAR. Okay, okay, I've never done that, so I, I, okay. But yeah, hitting a baseball was definitely high on that list. Um, I believe ESPN should run reruns of baseball, yeah, Johnny, ones with Johnny Bench and Tommy Lasorda, San Diego Chicken. And Diego Chicken. Kids, if you're out there listening, do yourself a favor. Google, Google Mark Fidrich, the bird, and also Google the baseball bunch. Do yourself was, a favor. I mean, come on. That's classic. It ran for five years, I think, but classics. Loved it. I think it was on Saturday. What on Saturday? Saturday, on Saturday morning, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. I believe this year's World Baseball Classic was highly entertaining. Now, I, I got a feeling that some people in New York and Houston might disagree with you on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The injuries, I, I, I didn't account for the injuries, but some really, I mean, you come down to a, like, two Angels pitcher, you know, we got Mike Trout at the plate, you got Ashante pitching. I mean, come on, that's good stuff. That's Hollywood that, ending. That was a Hollywood ending. I, I will give you that. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, a couple good games at the end. Yeah, a couple, I didn't follow all the, the short end. Yeah, I didn't follow all the pool play stuff, but I thought the semifinals, I mean, there was some good some good baseball there. 
Here's one that I think we should admit, submit to Major League Baseball. I believe that circus music should be played throughout during a rundown. It, it, and here's where I steal that one from, because we would do that in Homer. And my brother, my brother has the gift of circus music coming out of his mouth. And so I'm, I'm going to do not try this at home, kids. But it's something like. So anytime we were, I mean, that was his way of being mad that we were not. I mean, we want to do a rundown in one to two throws. If it took us defensively more than a couple of throws, my brother standing next to me would start in with the circus yeah. music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a rule in my teams that I coached that if it took more than two throws, just drop your gloves. We're going to run some polls here. That that seems very fair. One to two throws max is all it should take. If it's, One if it's to two time. throws. I believe that catchers don't need to flash four fingers when they only throw three different pitches. That is awesome. Uh, that is awesome. I, this is good. So I'm pitching in college. We're at Boca Raton my freshman year, and we're we're losing like 19 to something. None of the pitchers can throw a strike. I'm the batting practice pitcher. So Coach Burbridge goes out to the mound and says, Salo, you're coming in. Because he knew I could throw a strike. Now, I'm not a college pitcher. I was barely a high school pitcher. But anyway, I go out to the mound. My, my roommate and teammate, Matt Babcock, comes out to the mound, all seriousness. And he said, Scott, here's what we're doing. One's a fastball, two's a curveball, three's a slider, four's a changeup. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. One's a fastball, two's a fastball, three's a fastball, four. I said, that's all I have. That's all I have. I don't need all your fingers. That's it. That's all I need. I might have a slower fastball, but that's about it. That's it. That's all I got. That's all I got for you. This one I loved, and and I think it's it's a it's a lost art in the game of baseball. I think all young kids should be required to keep a scorebook. I mean, come on. We're not talking reading, game changer. Reading, writing, arithmetic, scorebook. Scorebook. It should be a class. I mean, come on. It should be a class. Custer Elementary. Let's go. Add it. I believe that. I believe with all with how well pitchers are paid, they shouldn't <laughs> run away from infield pop ups. I, I have had some of the best athletes to walk grounds at Homer and be pitchers, right? Yeah. I mean, Mr. Baseball, all of that. I'm saying, you know what? If it's to you, catch the stinking <laughs> ball. Catch the ball. Right. Maybe the rule is Simple. if you got to go backwards, maybe I trip it on the mound. But other than that, you should be able to catch it. Fair enough. Fair enough. But to see them sprint away like it's like some kind of a plague, Come on, guys. Verlander, <laughs> catch the pop-up. Scherzer, catch the pop-up. This one here makes me chuckle every time I see it happen, and you see it happen all the time. I believe avoiding stepping on the chalk line should only be for grass fields. That one makes hey, you me know laugh. It's funny because I talked about uh, uh, Josh Coleman,er he would do that. And I'm thinking that was just like, you know, his, you know, jinx, you know, don't step on the chalk line. I'm thinking, okay, I get that. If you're saving our custodial team, the old school chalk machine, but dude, it's painted on there. It ain't going anywhere. <laughs> it ain't going nowhere. It ain't going anywhere. It ain't going I believe crying should be allowed in baseball. Sincerely, Tiger fans. And boy, do I feel that one. Yeah. I'd like to say this is the year. And that's the good thing about spring. It's, you know, Ernie Harwell, and I'm going to do a post here in a little bit today. Love Ernie. All is right with the world today. The sun, the smell of grass. I mean, everything yeah. just feels right. And the Tigers are in first place, Rick. They're in first place today. They are tied for first. That's tied right. Tied for first. I believe you shouldn't make the first or third out at third base. You know what? And the more you think about it, you really shouldn't make any out at any base. That is yeah, so I profound. Mean, I mean, if you're going to go and try to not make outs and, like, try to overthink it, it's like, dude, the whole idea is to try to be on base and score a run. I mean, I don't want to make any out, so don't overthink it. I believe back flips should only be allowed after home runs if pitchers can break dance after strikeouts. That seems fair, right? I don't know how that I don't know how well that would go over, but some kind of a moonwalk or something, maybe cabbage yeah. patch. Something. Michael Jackson there. Something. This one is I think people echo this one throughout the baseball world. If a ball hits the foul pole, it should be foul. Man, my dad always jokes about that one. That's always his ongoing joke. It's like it should be called the fair pole. So I, I had to start out with that one. That was my very first one. That one was a that tribute was to my dad. Yeah, well, uh, your dad is is definitely spot on and, and very wise. So I see yeah. where you get it. People talk about that all the time. And especially when I take people or, or uh, my daughter and son's younger and everything else, my first question that my daughter asked me is, why is it a foul pole if it's fair? And it's, I don't know, she was like five or six at the time, you know, yeah. and 
She, right. she couldn't understand it. Sharp kid. Here's one for Major League Baseball, too. Every kid should get a foam finger at their first game. It's a it's a rite of passage. Rite right? of passage. It's a rite of passage. I mean, yeah. to look out there at the third inning and your team's down by three or up by four and you get that kid, puts his hand up into that little mitten and sticks it up in the air and say the Pirates, the Orioles, the you know, not the Indians, Insert the Guardians. Here. Yeah, they're all number one. You know, I got my foam finger. Yep. Insert team here. I believe that hockey, football, and basketball coaches should be required to wear team uniforms like they do in baseball. And you know what? I didn't think about that, but it's a lot of sense. What what's up with that? I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'd love to see basketball coaches on the sideline with their shorts. Maybe you know some kind of a headband. You know, I don't know. Think about the ho- the hockey guys. Maybe in, in full you know hockey. I, I I think it would be catchy. I think I think people would like really appreciate that. Yeah, I never thought about that one, but that one that one that made me chuckle. I went, I, went, yeah. I went deep on that one. I went deep. Here's another one for Major League Baseball to kind of spruce up things. You believe that players should be required to sign autographs in the lobbies during rain delays. I mean, what else are you going to do? I, I I hear stories, and, and Josh would tell me. I said, Josh, rain delay, two hours, what are you doing? Ah, oh, we, you know, we got a buffet. We're playing cards. We're in the hot tub. We're in the sauna. I said, okay, all right, cut your sauna down. Cut your card playing down. Maybe make one trip to the buffet and not two, and go sign some autographs for the kids. Yeah, I I've said that when they talked about doing things to improve the Major League Baseball experience, right? One of my ideas or suggestions, which I'm sure they're going to listen to to me as about as much as they listen to you. Yeah, they, they might. Was, was for the accessibility, right? Exactly. Absolutely. That was Absolutely. that was the that was pretty easy. I mean, it seemed to be pretty obvious. Um. I believe that peanuts and hot dogs taste better at the ballpark. And that is a fact. That's not a belief. That's a fact. I mean, you ask me if I want to eat a hot dog today at the house. Probably not. You take no. me to the ballpark today and you smell that hot dog coming down the aisle. When they open yep. up that lid on that bad boy and you can just get. I need four stuff. of them. Come on. I need four of them. Yep, but if, if they weren't $12 a piece, I probably would have four of them. Yeah. 50 bucks. You can get four. I believe that whoever invented or introduced sunflower seeds should be in the baseball hall of fame. That's a rite of passage with baseball, isn't it? Sunflower seeds. And why seeds? You know, it's just, it, it's a miracle. Those two things coming together. I mean, it's so random. It feels like it, it should have been grapes or like cheese chunks. Why the sunflower seed? But you know what? More power. To them. Great combination. Yeah. Then, then, then you had a couple here that's near and dear to my heart. And, and I totally agree with you in this. I believe that Trammell and Whitaker are the greatest double play combination in the history of the game. I'm not even sure there's a close second. Who would you? I, I mean, don't who's either. Second? Who's second? I, I, it just it starts and ends with Trammell Whitaker. Starts and ends. I, and the next one goes right hand in hand with it. I believe Lou Whitaker needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. I think Let's this get it podcast, done. This, I don't even know if he can even get in. I don't know the right. I don't know how that works anymore. But I think this podcast, people are going to follow this. And I think Lou's going to get in. Let's get him in. He should Let's be. In he should have already been in. All in for Actually, Luke. I think they should have went in as a tandem. Wouldn't that have been cool? How cool would that, that would have been? Too bad. So cool if they would went in oh. as a tandem. Oh, Major League, Major baseball, League baseball! They missed, they missed yeah. out on that. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. They missed the boat on that one. They should have put them in as a tandem. Yep. I believe listening to Ernie Harwell and Paul Keir in the radio is one of my favorite memories of my grandpa. And you know, God bless you, Scott, for that because the people that didn't get a chance to listen to Ernie and Paul, man, they missed out on one of the greatest things oh. in life. Oh. I mean, we in, in the game would be on. I mean, you could you could watch George Cal and Al Kaline do the TV uh, broadcast, but there's nothing like my grandpa sitting in his bedroom listening to the AM radio, listening to Ernie and Paul Carey. Thank you, Paul Carey. I mean, come on. You could close your eyes and you were at the game. You were at yeah, the best. I believe that less than ten percent of the fans truly understand the infield fly rule. <laughs> do you think it's ten? You think it's that high? I don't even know. No, that seems high. Yep. That seems but high. I, but I love the 95% people that just yell out at the crowd, yell out at the umpires anyway. You know, it's like they know what they're saying. Oh, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Uh, good stuff. Uh, I believe that punting is a lost art in the game of baseball. Oh, my God. That is – that couldn't have been anything more truer that you've said in this list than that. Well, I mean, you think about it. When do major leaguers bunt? Typically in September and October when they're playing meaningful baseball. And they wonder why they can't get the bunt down because they, they haven't done why. it for – you haven't done it for the five months prior. In the last few years, when they start with that runner on second base and extra innings, 
I, I mean, I, I would lose my voice. My wife would say, what are you screaming at the TV for? They can't hear you. And I'm like, bunt, bunt him over to third. And yep. no, you never did it. Bunt him over, sack fly, you're on the board. You're on the board. On the board. I believe that there are 42 different companies that make baseball cards. It used to be tops. You're right. It used yeah. to be tops. But yeah, Tyrus, now is, clear or something. They're all over the place. Yeah, they're all over the place. Too bad for the kids. Um, and finally, Scott, you believe that you once played six consecutive innings. Was just shy of the 2,632 consecutive games that Ripken played, but you were close. Yeah, and here here's a little known fact. You know, we, we you know one of our high school classmates, right, Dan Hilliard, who I know has been on your show, good friend yeah. of mine. I played with Dan in high school and in college, which was pretty cool. And so here's my my claim to fame in high school. Uh, when he was pitching, we would, and I don't remember who who was next to me, but it's almost like the backup quarterbacks given the dummy signs. I was the dummy sign guy for Dan when he was pitching, and I don't remember what I was doing with my hands. But I was, oh. yeah, yeah, I was the one to not look at because I was the dummy sign guy for Mr. Baseball in 1987. I was that guy. Well, hey, any any part of his success you can claim. I I talk to him all the time. I, I think I'm a part of his success. I mean, it, absolutely. He, if he looks at me and I give him a sign and he thinks I am the sign guy and he throws that pitch and he gets hit, I mean, come on. And his ERA – Partly because of me. It is. It's partly because of you. Scott Sallow is is connected to Dan Hilliard for immortality. Yeah, something. What's that? All, what, what's that? Uh, who's that guy on Footloose? You know, the seven seven factors of what, what's his name? You know what I'm talking about. Well, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. That's me. It, that's like Dan Hilliard. That's my six degrees of Dan Hilliard. <laughs> well, folks, listen. If you want to hear more from Scott Sallow and these, these I Believes, which – Take a few minutes and read these. I just read a few excerpts from what he did. They are purely enjoyable. Um, some of them you might not understand if you don't live in Michigan, but for the most part, they all apply to baseball. Um, again, you can find them on Facebook at Extra Innings, Living My Best Life by Scott Sallow, and take a few minutes to enjoy those. Scott, man, I can't tell you how enjoyable this has been, um, not only reliving some memory uh, memories of our past, but also, I'm sure you enjoy going back to the to the Homer streaks and and the games and and all the times and the, and the the fanfare that went along with it. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to have you on. And um, you know, we will we will stay in tune with you and, and follow you on your Facebook posts because I'm sure there'll be some more enjoyable ones to come. Wow, I appreciate it. appreciate the opportunity to speak and uh, good catching up with you. High school teammates, high school classmates right here. 1987. Come on, bro. 1987. Let's go. Let's go. All right, Scott. Hey, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. And um, we will we will talk to you soon. Thanks, Rick.